So So uh, this is our webinar, second C2V2 webinar on Oracle Server Suite 11G performance tuning. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the topic of this webinar, which is diagnosing and tuning performance problems in the Java Virtual Machine. My name is uh, Matt Brazier. I'm uh, the head of consulting at C2V2. Uh, I have quite a few years experience of uh, Oracle Server Suite and uh, Java performance tuning in general. So hopefully some of this uh, information will be useful to some of you. Uh, I'm also uh, authoring a book on the topic of uh, Oracle Server Suite 11G performance tuning. So some of this stuff uh, is the kind of stuff that we're covering in that book. So if this is of interest to you, then uh, I would look up that book. So this is part of a series of webinars. The first webinar, Principles of Performance Tuning, has already taken place. So uh, there's a YouTube link there. You'll be able to find that on YouTube. Or if you look on the C2B2 YouTube channel, you will find that. Uh, so that first webinar talks about principles of performance tuning. It outlines a scientific methodology for approaching a performance problem, looking at the uh, uh, hypothesizing about a cause, uh, performing testing, getting benchmark metrics, then making a single change, rerunning your benchmarks, interpreting how those metrics have changed, and understanding what's going on inside. Then uh, we have more webinars that work up through the stack of the uh, the server suite system. So this one is going to talk about uh, the Java virtual machine and tuning the Java virtual machine. We will have a webinar on uh, tuning and scaling web logic, so the application server, and then we'll look at some of the components of server suites, so the service bus, uh, the Beeple engine, and then we'll talk about uh, monitoring with Enterprise Manager. So monitoring is very important to any kind of performance tuning effort because you need to know what your performance is like. You need to be able to measure the impact of changes that you make. Uh, rolling out a new version, you want to understand how has that impacted performance. And so by having monitoring end-to-end -end through all of your different environments, you'll be in a situation to do that. So diagnosing and tuning performance problems in the Java virtual machine. The topics that I'm going to talk about are uh, relatively straightforward. So. I'm going to talk a bit about the Java Virtual Machine, what it is, how it works, some of the kind of common misconceptions people have about it and why they don't need to think about the Java Virtual Machine uh, when they come to do performance tuning. The common problems are a couple of the common causes of uh, performance problems that you might see that are uh, Java Virtual Machine related. Uh, and then some of the tools that we can use to diagnose those problems and some comments on how you go about uh, tuning to get around those problems. So what is the Java Virtual Machine? All Java applications run inside the Java Virtual Machine. Uh, when you type Java on the command line and give it a name of a class to run, uh, that starts up the Java Virtual Machine. The classes are bytecode, so Java applications are not compiled into machine code, they are compiled into bytecode, which is an intermediate language that allows Java to be platform independent, and then individual Java virtual machines can take that bytecode and turn it into the most performant code uh, for the necessary platform. So that means that on uh, one platform, a set of instructions might get encoded into one set of machine code constructs, and on another platform, it might get encoded into completely different logical constructs because that platform is able to uh, more quickly execute a different set of logical constructs. So the Java virtual machine does this translation between this intermediate bytecode and uh, the actual uh, machine code that gets operated on the uh, or that gets executed. Uh, it does this on the fly, so there's a lot of clever compiling and stuff going on, and it's very, very good at it. Uh, but the main thing that we want to consider about the virtual machine is that it's providing an abstraction of the various services offered by the operating system. So that's an abstraction of memory, so storage. Uh, the Java virtual machine offers a, a heap to uh, application developers. They can create objects, and those objects get placed on the heap. They can then uh, 
when they no longer need those objects, the uh, Java Virtual Machine will automatically clear that up, for, clear the memory up for them. That's garbage collection. It provides an abstraction of the threading model, so different uh, operating systems have different threading models. Some use threads, some use processes, some have uh, one thread per uh, one process per thread, some have uh, threads as an independent thing within their threading model. So the JVM abstracts that uh, and you don't have to know the difference between processes and threads. You don't have to deal with heavyweight and lightweight threads. The, op the virtual machine will handle that for you and will abstract to the best uh, uh, model for your uh, underlying operating system. It also provides an abstraction of I.O., so concepts of uh, file systems, directories, accessing data on disk is all handled by the underlying Java virtual machine and you can just say load me a file or load, read the bytes out of this file. You don't need to worry about uh, finding the right or using the right drivers, using reading from different uh, DMA memory addresses and all of that kind of thing. This is all handled as in the abstractions of the Java virtual machine. And other I.O. as well, so network I.O., uh, any I.O. with external devices is all handled through abstractions uh, in the Java virtual machine. Uh, so the Java virtual machine communicates with the operating system and sorts out the, the relevant uh, processes, etc. So some of the questions or some of the comments that people will then make will be, well, the JVM is just a black box. It does these things. It just gets on and does it. There's nothing I can do about how it works. I'll just let it get on with it. And if it breaks, I'll just complain about it. Uh, the JR, Java Virtual Machine since uh, Java 1.4 and Java 5 has been very good at exposing its inner workings over the JMX uh, protocol and API. So you can see statistics about how many classes it's loaded, which classes it's got loaded, how it's compiling data, how many threads it's got, what those threads are doing, how much memory it's using, how is it running garbage collecting? What algorithms is it using? You can change some of these things at runtime all via this JMX protocol. Uh, there are also command line flags that affect how it performs optimizations, which types of optimizations it does, how it manages its memory, how aggressive it is in, uh, in garbage collecting, how aggressive it is in optimizing the code. So you have these uh, hundreds of flags that you can play with and hundreds of statistics that you can play with. Uh, that will uh, determine uh, how all of this stuff works. So, uh, yeah, we have all of these uh, these uh, various settings. So, uh, so we have these various options that we can play with. Uh, it's not just a black box. Uh, and another comment is that the JVM just run code, runs the code that I tell it to. So this isn't true at all. Uh, the Java Virtual Machine uses your ap application code as a uh, guideline, but it works out uh, what the best way it can implement what you want to do is via the various uh, uh, settings available to it, via the, the different optimizations that it can perform. So if you tell it, uh, I want to do, uh, I want to concatenate strings, it's sensible enough to know that it can create string buffers and do it that way, and that's going to be quicker than just using strings. Uh, the JVM also has all of these internal processes that run, such as garbage collection and memory management, such as thread management, uh, that are uh, outside of, are not outside of your control, but they go on irrespective of what your program is doing. So you need to be aware of these uh, features. Uh, and also, people will say, well, there's nothing I can do to change how the JVM works. It just kind of gets on and does its thing. Uh, and as we've mentioned, that uh, uh, couldn't be more wrong, really. Uh, the JVM uh, does what you tell it to do. Uh, there are lots of options in tuning it and playing with it and that kind of thing. And we're going to talk about a few of those. So what kind of problems might you see? Well, the main ones are to do with the resources that are managed by the JVM. So uh, memory and threading are the two big ones. Garbage collection, which is this process of going and finding memory that is no longer used by the application and freeing it up so that that space can be used for storing new data. Uh, and threading, creating threads, and then managing the interaction between threads. So that's uh, synchronization and locking and things like that. 
that's all uh, managed by the JVM and is something that uh, can go wrong. So you can see deadlocks. You can have thread contention where you have multiple threads all trying to get hold of the same resource. And locking, which is a similar thing, multiple threads all trying to get hold of the same lock. Uh, these are all kind of things that might go wrong uh, in uh, the JVM. So starting with garbage collection then. So what is garbage collection? Well, garbage collection is the deletion of data structures that are no longer needed by your application code. So uh, it looks for data that is no longer relevant and frees that up. Uh, there are naive ways of doing that. You could start at the beginning and you could look at each piece of data and see if you can trace it back to a live piece of code. Uh, that was very early Java virtual machines did that. Uh, now things have moved on a lot. There are concepts of generational garbage collection. There are concepts of uh, of uh, parallel garbage collection, garbage or well, different garbage collection algorithms, uh, concurrent mark sweep, and things like that. Prioritizing low pause versus high throughput garbage collector. So there are lots of things you can tune in the garbage collector. Uh, garbage collection has certain triggers. So not being enough uh, heap free to allocate an object is one of the key ones. Uh, code can initiate garbage collection by calling system.gc uh, or if the, one of the sizes of one of the different memory pools that the JVM uses changes then that can initiate garbage collection and we care about garbage collection a lot because it's what's called a stop the world event so that means that uh, the nothing happens when you run the garbage collector your application code or when the garbage collector runs your application code stops executing and the JVM does nothing but garbage collection so if you create a lot of garbage and it takes a long time to collect it, then it can stop for five, ten seconds, minutes possibly even. And during that time, your application is essentially hung as far as any users are concerned. So generational memory is based on the theory of uh, infant mortality. So this is the uh, theory that uh, most objects that you create within your application become irrelevant very quickly. You create them inside a loop. As soon as you exit that loop, that object has gone out of scope. You can't reference it anymore. So you can create a garbage collector which uh, rapidly looks at new objects to see if they need garbage collecting. And then the longer an object lives, the uh, less frequently the space it's in gets garbage collected. So the memory gets divided into a new generation and the permanent generation. The new generation contains uh, an Eden space and uh, a number of survivor spaces, normally two. So objects get initially allocated in the Eden space. After they've survived the garbage collection in Eden, they go into the survivor space. They flip-flop between the survivor spaces for a little while, and after they've survived the number of garbage collections, they then go into the permanent generation. So we can then garb use different garbage collection algorithms in the different spaces. We can use copy garbage collection in the new generation, which is very space inefficient but very fast. And we can use uh, another garbage collection algorithm uh, in the Old, old permanent generation, old generation, and uh, that can be less efficient, so use one which is more space efficient but less time efficient. So the main garbage collection problem then is garbage collection taking too long, either through uh, a single garbage collection that takes a long time or garbage collecting frequently, and each time you garbage collect, not collecting too much, not collecting enough uh, free memory so that you then need to run another one soon afterwards. Uh, I'll demonstrate some of the tools afterwards, so I'm just going to talk about threading problems first. So the main problems with threading is deadlocks, uh, thread pool starvation is another one. So uh, you have a pool of threads, say 100 threads, and you're trying to service 200 users. Each user requires a thread, then you're going to have 100 of those users not able to do anything in the application because there are no free threads until one of the existing thread users finishes and then a thread uh, becomes available. And locking, so contention over locks. A thread locks a resource because it needs exclusive access to it. If that resource is hotly contested, lots of threads will be trying to get and release that lock, uh, and you essentially get single-threaded performance from your multi-threaded application. Uh, some of the other problems you might see on the JVM uh, are related to file descriptors. So on Linux and Unix-based systems, running out of file descriptors can be an issue on an application server. The default number of file descriptors is usually 1,024. It's uh, very, very easy to go over that with a server suite installation. So increasing the number of file descriptors available to the user that is running server suite is uh, important. And uh, virtualization-related memory problems, I won't go into that too 
much depth here, but uh, the way certain uh, hypervisors uh, of virtualization infrastructures deal with uh, memory can be an issue because of the way that the JVM massively frees out huge chunks, huge chunks of memory very quickly and then slowly uses it back up again. Uh, and the, uh, the virtualization, the memory virtualization driver thinks that you've closed an application because all of that memory has become free and it takes you off, takes off you and then you try and use it again because you hadn't finished uh, and that memory is not available and, and things go very slowly. So there are two t uh, tools which I'm going to briefly talk about for diagnosing garbage collection problems. Uh, they're both tools that come with uh, the JVM. So one of them is JSTAT, which is a command line uh, tool that comes with the JVM. It prints out uh, statistics on the command line related to a number of functions. The most useful parameters are GC cores, which shows you the sizes of the various memory spaces, uh, and GC, which shows you the percentages that they're full rather than the uh, actual size. There's also the Visual GC, a uh, Visual VM uh, graphical tool, which gives you the same information in uh, uh, graphical format. Again, that comes with the JVM. Uh, there's a Visual GC plugin uh, that can be used to visualize garbage collection information. JSTAC for threading problems uh, produces a thread dump, and a thread dump, if you've not seen one before, is a stack trace of ev for every thread in the application of what it was doing at that instant in time. Uh, if you specify minus L, it will uh, print, print detailed locking information, so you can see what threads are holding what locks, uh, uh, including the Java Util concurrent locks, so you can understand uh, which resources, which threads are holding resources. If lots of threads are all waiting on one particular resource, uh, then you're going to have problems with threading. And Visual VM, again, has some views for uh, viewing thread-related information. So. I was just going to give a quick demonstration of some of these tools. So I will start up a WebLogic server so you can see what's going on. So uh, while that is starting, and it will prompt me for a password in a second, I'll open another console. Uh, so we can run some of these tools. So we can get the process ID using JPS of the server, so 860, so then we can do JSTAT, GC cores. Uh, so that will print out every two seconds, we'll print out the uh, garbage collection statistics, the cause of any garbage collections that have happened and that type of thing. So we can see S0, S1 are the uh, sizes of the uh, survivor spaces in percentages. So S0 isn't full. Uh, S1 is 73.58% full. E is the Eden size, so that's 3.54% full. O is the old generation, that's empty, 0% full. Uh, P is the permanent generation for storing class files and things like that. Uh, YGC, the number of young garbage collections, YGCT, the amount of time spent garbage collecting, FGC, the number of full garbage collections, FCGT, the amount of time, total garbage collection time, and then the cause of a garbage collection if one has occurred recently. Uh, and then as we start the server up, you will see some of these parameters start to change. Uh, so we can see the size of the uh, Eden space growing as more objects are allocated, then they get the garbage collection happens, so we see the number of young garbage collections go up, uh, and the size of the survivor space zero changes, uh, things are migrated out from survivor space uh, while into the old generation, the old generation grows a little bit, it's now 2.5% full. So we can see garbage collection happening. Uh, we can see the amount of time, so if that amount of time is high or if full garbage collections are happening frequently, then that's a problem and we need to look at tuning garbage collection. 
uh, which is a topic that's a bit too complicated to talk about in this webinar, but uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, and then for thread-related information, I'll just show you quickly uh, what JSTAC does. If I can press the right keys. So this prints out, well, it's going to be too long for here and scroll off, but this prints out for each thread in the application exactly what it's doing at the instant in time that I ran the command. So here we have a thread that was uh, loading a class from a uh, archive file uh, and doing some stuff within that archive file. So we can see there's a servlet, so it's, a, uh, it's trying to load a web application and it's loading the various JSPs and compiling them into uh, servlets within that web application. So from this we can see any locks that are hold, so held, so I'll see if there's any examples here. So we can see on this line locked 0 by 0 E71D4C0, uh, which is a jar file, so it's got a lock on that. It's also got a lock further down on a class loader and further down on that on a different class, or the same class loader. So it's a re-entrant lock. Uh, so we can see uh, locking information using uh, JSTAC. So, solving these problems then. So, garbage collection problems, the options available to us. Tuning the garbage collector, we can change the uh, al garbage collection algorithms we use, whether we use uh, parallel garbage collection, concurrent mark sweep garbage collection. We can tune the size of the memory pools, so that doesn't necessarily mean making them bigger. Bigger is not always faster in Java. Uh, we've had customers who've got had multi gigabyte, tens of gigabytes, 30, 50 gigabyte heaps, wondering why uh, every couple of days the application freezes for 10 minutes whilst it goes and does a garbage collection. That's what's going to happen if you have a heap that big. You're going to run and not need to run garbage collection for ages, and then when you do, you've got to garbage collect 56 gig of heap, and that's going to be very painful. In that case, bringing the heap size down and getting it to the point where you have a garbage collection that takes 200 milliseconds and happens every hour is much better than having a garbage collection that happens every couple of days and takes 10 minutes. So changing the sizes, changing the relative sizes, so increasing uh, the new generation and decreasing the old generation, for example. Changing survivor ratios, so the size of the survivor spaces compared to the uh, old, uh, to the new Eden generation. Uh, disabling explicit garbage collection so that developers can't, if they type system.gc into their code, then nothing happens. Uh, it's generally best to let the, or it's always best to let the, app, the JVM decide when it wants to do garbage collection and not let application developers try and decide. JVM has a much, and JVM developers have a much better idea of when garbage collection needs to occur than application developers. Threading problems, and normally you're going to be looking at code changes if you've got locking problems and things like that. You need to go back and understand the order that you're acquiring locks, how uh, you're locking things and what's going on. Uh, if you've got uh, thread pool starvation, so uh, you've not got enough HTTP acceptor threads to accept all of your incoming HTTP requests, and thread pool size tuning is the thing you want to be looking at. Uh, so there's a number of options available for solving threading problems as well. So hopefully that's been about the 20 minutes that we're allocated. That was a quick whistle-stop tour through some of the things that you can do in uh, tuning the JVM. Uh, tuning the JVM is important because it sits right at the bottom. If you can get a 10% performance improvement in memory allocation in the JVM, that's 10% for every operation that your application does across every use case. So that's basically a 10% across the board performance increase. Similarly, if something is running 50% slower, that's your entire application running 50% slower, not just some use case. So it's important because these changes are right at the bottom of the stack. So the JVM provides all the necessary tools to identify these common problems. Uh, they all come with a JVM, JSTAC, uh, JSTAT, J Visual VM, or all uh, JVM tools. There are also configuration parameters you can specify with the JVM to change how it starts up. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but fixing these problems once you've identified them, uh, identifying them is half the battle, fixing them is the other half, uh, and some of that might require changes to your code, uh, some of it might be things that you can do in the infrastructure, so memory management is normally infrastructure, but threading is often a code related issue. So uh, if anybody has any questions, then if you type them in the little questiony box thing, then I will do my best to answer them. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you've learned something useful. As I mentioned earlier, we have got a book coming out on this, uh, probably be later on in the year. Uh, will be the uh, Oracle Server Suite 11G Performance Cookbook, or Oracle Server Suite 12G Performance Cookbook, depending whether we get it updated or whether Server Suite 12G comes out in time for us to update the book. Uh, it's going to be published by uh, Pact Publishing, so keep an eye out for that. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, then uh, feel free to ask them, and I will uh, do my best to uh, answer them. So yeah, I think the audio problems were uh, internet related. Uh, the GoToWebinar site was being a bit slow earlier and things like that. So uh, hopefully they were resolved then. Uh, so if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to uh, type them in. Otherwise, uh, thanks for watching. No, okay, right, so no questions, so thanks very much for attending, and uh, and hopefully you will be, uh, have time to come and watch some of our other webinars, and uh, if you really are interested in this stuff, then keep an eye out for our book. Uh, thanks very much, guys.